Yes. Okay. So, can we get started? Okay. Okay. So answers. Yeah. Uh, I think it can search until it runs out of battery. It is search for the trash and then it runs out of battery. Uh, no, no, that is not. Uh, that is not possible. Like if you are maximizing the reward here. Um, okay, many people race, maybe, yeah. Well, it depends how your robot is created, but you have no end condition right now. Mm -hmm. And if we say that your robot is perfect and that your battery is perfect and it could, it doesn't run out of battery if it doesn't move, it could just stay in place forever because if it collects all the, tr if it moves and collects trash, whenever there's less than a hundred pieces of trash, if it collects, let's say 50 pieces, it will subsequently run out of battery and then end up at minus 50. I don't know if this makes sense. Okay, but that is not what I'm looking for. Uh, it doesn't consider the environmental factors so far. So whether there's a okay, Not that, it's not the environmental factor, but I'm going to see if there are just, okay. Uh, I think in the first chapter, it, the robot doesn't know if it's gonna get the punishment, so the robot's gonna be out of the battery in the next chapter. No, okay, so I think there is a little bit of confusion here, okay? So I am not asking about what are all the things that could go wrong, okay? So here we are assuming that we already have the system which is achieving the maximum possible reward. Now, would this system satisfy the actual practical objective, which is to keep the keep the room clean, or would it do something else? Yeah. Well, there is no uh, nothing that uh, incentivizes the robot to uh, to use his battery to its full potential. Like he could go get trash and recharge. Not that, not that, because there is all this incentives. Uh, like I think has been already in there because. We are assuming that we have a system which is getting the maximum reward. So, yeah. So, you can like uh, find the spot near the battery station and exploit that actually, like trash. No, so then you will not get the maximum reward. The maximum reward is achieved when the room is completely clean. Yeah. This is the problem that there is no cost of doing action until you get to the end of the experience. You can only. Oh, but that's a challenge, right? Like, so we will talk about that challenge throughout the course. Like, so not, that's not what I'm asking here. Yeah. So could it just like throw out the trash it already collected and recollect it again? Yes. So that is the unexpected behavior that would happen. Okay. So, so the goal here is to maximize the reward, right? So there is nothing in this reward structure that stops this agent to just pick a trash, put it again in the floor and pick it again. You get a plus one every time you pick it, right? So, so this is an example of a classic faulty reward design. Like so. For example, if the environment is in such a way that every time you put the trash in the trash can, it disappears or gets suppressed, like or it is taken out, okay? So then this behavior will not happen. But if the agent has full control over the environment, like then probably it will just put it in the trash can, like trash the place more and, and get rewards for cleaning it up, okay? So, so, so this is just one uh, example of places where like, you might not see the behavior that you are expecting uh, because of the reward structure, okay? So now this tells you both the plus and minus of rewards, okay? So plus is it's too simplistic, okay? Minus is, again, it's too simplistic. So, so you could have unexpected behaviors. So you have to be careful um, so that uh, when you are like designing your own rewards structure, like for your robots or for your uh, software agents, like you have to be very careful, okay? And probably towards the end of the course, we will spend some time on uh, reward design, uh, but for at least the first half of the course, like we are, going, we are just going to assume that someone has given this reward structure, okay? We are not going to question the right or the correctness of the reward structure, okay? Now, there is this famous reward hypothesis, okay? which tells us that, that all of what we mean by goals and purposes 
can be well thought of as maximization of the expected value of the cumulative sum of a received scalar signal. Okay, the scalar signal is called reward. Okay, so the reward hypothesis tells us that any goal that you want to have, okay, um, like can be well thought of as maximization of some expected value of this cumulated sum of the received scalar signal. So, so in some sense, you can construct a reward and that reward would help, like maximizing that reward would help the agent to achieve that goal, okay? Now, is this all enough, right? Like, so can you simulate any behavior that you want to be simulated, like just by using rewards, right? Like, so it looks like rewards are a bit limited, right? Like it's a scalar signal. Like, so when we give it, when we give feedback, we give more than a scalar reward, right? Like, so, like, I don't give you just a mark, like, like, like just, just, an, just a grade, like, for like, when I evaluate you, right? Like, I also tell you, okay, this is where you have done something wrong, like, you could improve this, or, like, look up for this reference for this and so on. Like, we give a lot of more feedback than just a single scalar reward. So, so the obvious question is, is it just enough, right? Like, so can we achieve artificial intelligence by just using rewards. So very recently, so there is this interesting paper, uh, like a philosophical paper, uh, which argues that reward is enough to do whatever you want to do, okay? So that will be the reading for probably next week or the next two next week. Uh, but for now, I just want to state the hypothesis, which is reward is enough. Hypothesis. Okay, so now this hypothesis is by Silver et al. 2021. You can see it's just a few months back. And so this hypothesis basically says that intelligence and its associated abilities, okay, can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward by an agent acting in its environment. Okay. So the reward hypothesis tells us that any goal that you want to construct, you can construct a reward function for that and maximizing that is enough. Um, and reward is enough is like much more general hypothesis, which says that, in fact, you can do all of intelligence by just having a reward structure, like and any, any agent, which is maximizing this reward structure is going to like exhibit that intelligence. Okay, so it's a very strong statement. Um, I think there are kind of mixed reactions for this hypothesis in the community, uh, but it roughly tells us the significance of rewards. Okay, so now, now we will get to the question that somebody asked, like, so what is the difference between this reward structure and the loss that we have in supervised learning, right? So to do that, we are going to take a quick detour to machine learning. So this is for people who have not done machine learning. And even if you have done machine learning, we are going to see the differences, okay? So a quick detour to ML. Okay, so now in machine learning, so there are, yeah? Uh, when you say hypothesis, do you mean that it hasn't been proven? Yes. Okay. Well, there are philosophical arguments for why this should be the case, but there's no rigorous proof. Okay, um, okay. so any other questions? Okay, so I think people in the Zoom are having a really nice conversation in the chat. Uh, in case I miss any of the questions in the conversation, like, please raise your hand. I will see uh, the raised hands. Okay, so a quick detour to ML. So, so in machine learning, there are three major learning paradigms, okay? So the first is supervised learning. And then we have unsupervised learning.
and then we have reinforcement learning. Of course, there are many, many other emerging learning paradigms. Like so, so there are probably like twenty other learning paradigms. Like so, but you can broadly classify all of them into either of these three categories. Okay. Now, so what is supervised learning, right? So the whole idea of supervised learning is that you have some training data which is given to you. Okay. The training data, let's just call it DTR, is basically a bunch of XI and YI. X is the input, Y is the output, okay? And the goal of entire supervised learning is just to learn a function F from X to Y, okay? Such that, like learn this function by using the training data, such that given a new X, okay? So given a new X, the model or the function F should be able to make an accurate prediction of what would be the output. Okay, so in some sense, the goal in supervised learning is all about generalizing to unseen instances. Like, so when you have a completely unseen, um, like X, like can you make an accurate prediction of Y? Okay, so the example that I would like to give here, which we have already seen, is the movie review classification, like where X is the review and Y is basically plus one or minus one. Okay, so plus one for positive review. And minus one for negative review. Okay, now this is not a reward. This is actually the correct prediction. So whenever the model predicts plus one, it means it's a positive uh, statement sentiment. Whenever it predicts minus one, it is a negative sentiment. Okay. Now, as you can see, the entirety of supervised learning focuses too much on what I would call as prediction. Okay. So, so the whole idea of supervised learning is to come up with better and better models, which will make accurate predictions. Okay. Now, so this is supervised learning. So now let's quickly talk about what is unsupervised learning. Okay. Now, in unsupervised learning, as the name suggests, there is no supervision. Okay, you just have the data set X. Okay, so you have the data set, which is just X X. Okay. So given this data, the goal in unsupervised learning is all always like there is, there is a, there are a variety of goals, but roughly they are all uh, something like find some structure in the data. Okay, I can give you an example. Like, so for example, uh, let's say I have a bunch of news articles. Now I want to cluster these articles in such a way that each cluster represents a theme, okay? So now each cluster has articles which are similar to each other. At the same time, two clusters have articles which are different from each other, okay? Now this is a classical example for clustering, which is an unsupervised learning problem, okay? Now, if, like I, I want to like quickly point out uh, the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning here, right? Like, so in the case of clustering, like our goal is to come up with let's say k different clusters, which all corresponds to different topics, okay? However, had I had like a data set, which has a bunch of news articles and say which topic it belongs to, okay? If I already had known the set of topics and I have some examples for all the topics, then it becomes a supervised learning problem. So in supervised learning problem, the, the cluster topics are given to you. Right? Like so, on the other hand, in unsupervised learning, like you are also a bit of discovering the structure and discovering the different topics. Okay, so, so this is the parallel here. Now, finally, let's talk about reinforcement learning, okay, and see how it is different from these two learning paradigms. Okay, so now in the case of re reinforcement learning, like as I mentioned before, it's a bit different, like you have the agent environment setup, right? Like so where like you have observations coming from the environment, right? Like you have the environment and the environment is giving you some observation. Now this observation goes as input to the agent, right? And the agent is making some prediction, A1, right? Now this action is sent to the environment again, okay? 
Now, environment is going to give you a new observation, but it is also going to give you the reward, right? So, so in this case, the environment is giving you R2 and O2. This is given as input to the agent, and the agent is taking the next action. Now, this next action is given to the environment, and the environment is giving you R3 and O3. This is given to the agent, which takes A3 and so on. It's probably okay. So now you can see one major difference between the other learning paradigms on reinforcement learning, which is basically the interaction, right? Like, so there is a back and forth between agent and the environment, which is not happening in supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Like, for example, in the case of supervised learning, like you will train with all the data sets and then you go deploy the system online, like uh, in, a, in a website, and then it starts interacting with the users. So it will make predictions. But that is kind of a one way interaction because there's no feedback from the users, which is immediately utilized by the supervised learning system. Okay, so of course, you can simulate this interaction by collecting a bunch of data and then again training the system with the data. But there is no like online interaction uh, that happens in reinforcement learning, right? Like, so here, here you are not learning offline and then learning, like, and then performing, like, you're actually learning in the wild, like, you're learning online interacting right so so interaction is one major difference okay the second major difference here is the notion of time okay so r has this like inbuilt notion of time it's a temporal decision making process okay so like you are acting one after like one step after another right like so so it's a temporal decision making process which which is a bit different from the kind of examples that we have seen in supervised learning and unsupervised learning, okay? Now, what makes this even more challenging is actually this loop, okay? So here you can see that when the agent takes action one, okay? Now this action one is not just influencing the immediate reward, but because of this loop that it has, right? It impacts all the future rewards that you're going to see, right? Because my current action puts me in the next state. And then the entire episode evolves from the next state, right? Like, so in some sense, my actions decide where I'm going to go next and what kind of rewards I'm going to go get later, right? Like, so to give you an example, let's say you have an agent which somehow hits itself to the wall, okay? Now it damages itself. Now, this action is going to cut all the rewards in the future because now, like, it's not functional anymore, right? Like, so, so your current action is not just responsible for the immediate reward, but for your entire experience. So, so which makes it kind of complicated, okay? So, now, so what are the implications of this closed loop, right? Like, so, we have this closed loop interaction. Now, what are the implications of this closed loop? Okay, so now we are going to look at this close the, the closed loop interaction, like both from forward view of the world and backward view of the world. Okay, so both are going to give us different perspective of like the challenges involved in reinforcement learning. So first, let's start with forward view. Okay, so in the forward view, so you start with some observation, and then the agent takes an action. Okay, so the agent takes an action and the action goes to the environment and it gives you R2O2 and it goes to, again, the agent takes A2 and it goes to R3O3, right, in the environment. And, and then the agent takes an action A3, it goes to the environment, it gives you R4O4 and it proceeds, right? Now, the goal of this agent is not just to get good immediate reward, right? So the goal of the agent is to get or to maximize the cumulative reward i think the word cumulative here is important right so our goal is not just to get good reward now our goal is to get good reward for life okay so now so this means 
sometimes you have to take actions which puts you in a low reward state so that in the future you can actually get better better rewards okay now i can give you an example like so if you already seen the notes you know the example the example is like studying every day after the lecture okay so if you are studying every day after the lecture the immediate reward is probably low like you are missing going out uh, with your friends or like probably like like you want to do other fun activities like um, like which has more reward immediate reward for you right however this low reward like action that you are doing at the moment is going to give you a really good high reward in the end of the semester like when you have already prepared for the exam right like so now so i think the other example that i have in the notes is uh, when you are playing the game of chess okay so sometimes you have to sacrifice a coin so that you can move forward to a better state okay uh, but if you are just you, if you just have a myopic view of getting the best next reward then you will never lose a coin right like you will say you know that losing a coin is negative thing to do so you like you will just try to not lose a coin uh, but uh, expert chess players often sacrifice their queen or sacrifice a, a major coin so that they can actually uh, get a better deal uh, towards the end of the game right like so now in some sense like there are two things in play here okay so let me move this down so there are two things in play here so one is every action has an immediate reward which is r2 in this case right but every action also has a cumulative reward okay so the cumulative reward so what is the cumulative reward for a1 in this chain it's a sum of all the future rewards right like it's basically r2 plus r3 plus r4 plus r okay um now the goal of the agent is to maximize this not just r2 okay so we should be careful about that now this is about the forward view so now let's actually any questions okay so this is about the forward view so now let's actually think about the same process but in the backward view okay so, so this is the benefit of using a digital whiteboard so i can just copy this okay so now we are going to look at the backward view of the problem okay now in the backward view let's think about the implications of this closed loop okay now i told you in the forward loop forward view that each action decides all the future rewards right now this is a problem why is this a problem because for example let's think about um this specific reward here r4 okay now is this r4 purely based on a3 no right so now we don't know okay in fact we don't know it could be based on a3 or it could be based on a2 right like so so now it could be based on a3 or it could be based on a2 or it could be based on a1 or it could be based on certain sequence of actions that you took in the past right like so imagine you have thousand actions you have taken now now how where would you go assign this credit right like so now this problem of crediting which action is responsible for this good reward is known as or sometimes bad rewards is known as credit assignment okay now credit assignment happens like is a problem because of the delayed rewards that we see okay so sometimes you see the real reward only after a long time right like so even if you take the exam example right like so when you are studying you don't get the reward immediately but like you get the delayed reward which is at the end like you get an a or a plus right like so now this delayed reward is a problem because now we don't know where to associate this delayed reward okay uh, again to give you some chess example let's say let's say you win the game now did you win the game just because of the last action that you took most probably not right like so like last few steps are always like like 
it just rolls by itself, right? Like so, like so, you might have won the game because of this one smart decision that you took in the middle of the game, or sometimes even in the beginning of the game, right? Like so, so like how do you assign credits? Like for example, like we humans are really good in assigning these credits. Okay, so to give you a more practical example, let's say you're driving, and you hear a knock, like a big sound when you're driving. You drive like five kilometers ahead probably. So then you see that there's a flat tire. Okay, so when you get down, human minds immediately associate that sound that you heard like half an hour back to this flat tire. Like so, you would quickly infer that okay, maybe like I hit something or there was a thorn or like there was like a sharp stone uh, which could have led to this um, like flat tire, right? Like so, now how can we design systems which will have such credit assignment? Like so, it's one of the hardest problems in AI itself, like so not just reinforcement learning. And in fact, we are going to see several algorithms and several solid like approaches in this course, uh, which has the aim of doing better credit assignments. Okay, so so this is the backward view. So in the forward view, like you have uh, the thing that you are not just focusing on the immediate reward, you are focusing on like much futuristic rewards as well. And in the backward view, this creates a problem because like now you have to learn to do credit assignment. Okay, so any questions so far? Yep. Is the environment static or is it modified by the actions? Okay, no, no, oh, the environment is clearly modified by your actions, right? So like, for example, like if I take this and put it here, so I have changed the environment, right? Like, so sometimes it could have negative effect on the environment, climate change, right? Like, so like you can, you can have like, positive and negative effects on the environment. And sometimes you can control. There are of course a lot of things in the environment which is not under your control, uh, but there are also definitely a lot of things that you can control, so, yep. Uh, what is the role of the oh, so the backward view basically highlights the issue here, right? Like, so the issue is whenever I receive a reward, if I want to become a good agent, like 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 a like a better agent, like I should know how to associate this reward to which action I took because this is a trial and error process, right? Like so, nobody tells me which is the right action, right? Like so now I should remember, like not remember, like I should figure out by myself which action led to this reward. Um, any uh, yeah one? Is this credit assignment similar to like uh, uh, propagation in neural network? Yes, they are kind of, there are parallels. So, well, I think for people in the Zoom, I'm not sure if they heard the question, so I should try to repeat the question. So one last question before I take the Zoom question, thank you. So when we know that there's a, a problem with the you know, uh, uh, assignment, can we reverse some action? <laughs> okay, so in real world, you cannot reverse your actions, right? Like, so, uh, but we will also deal with a lot of simulated software settings where if you want, you can reset and go back to the previous state if you want. Okay. For example, let's say we are learning that like we are training a system to play video games. Now we have access to the game simulator, right? Like, so if you think you made a right, wrong action, you can roll back. But in real life, no. Like, for example, let's say you have a robot which damaged itself. No, you cannot reverse it back, right? Like you lost probably a million dollar robot. So... Uh, I'll take a couple of questions from Zoom. Um, so, okay, so when questions are asked in class, can you please repeat them? Yes, sorry, I should do it and I will do it. Um, how are the rewards generated in an unsupervised learning setting? Oh, so no, 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 we are not talking about reinforcement learning combined with unsupervised learning here. Like, so these are three, totally three different learning paradigms. Okay, so now let's. Now that I have introduced you all the learning paradigms, like let's quickly uh, like formalize the differences between these approaches, right? Like so, which I, I'm sure we have already discussed enough, but I'm just going to highlight them anyways. So first, RL versus supervised learning. Okay. Now, well, maybe I'll just post this as a question. So we have seen both supervised learning and reinforcement learning. So can someone tell me the differences between supervised learning and reinforcement learning? Uh, okay, so how about we give one chance for people in the Zoom? So, Shihab, so I see you have raised your hand. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you answer? Uh, 
Shihab? Uh, hi, sorry, I raised my hand for a uh, question that uh, we uh, already passed, so uh, uh, I think okay. it's relevant right now. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, but is there anyone from Zoom who wants to answer my question? Okay, we'll take answer here. So who wants to answer? Yeah. In supervised learning, we uh, use training data to find a pattern and predict something, but for reinforcement learning, we don't have training data. Okay, so supervised learning is about learning from data, but reinforcement learning is about learning from interaction. Okay, so RL is learning from interaction and supervised learning is learning from data and any other differences? Uh, supervised learning is like prediction, but RL is like reward system. Okay, so supervised learning focuses too much on prediction. You just predict, okay? But, oh, sorry. Uh, you just predict, right? Like on the other hand, in reinforcement learning, you, we do predictions, but we are using those, the predictions are not the goal. The predictions are the mean to act and achieve better reward, right? And so we predict, okay? But then we also use the prediction to control the environment. So there's both prediction and control involved in reinforcement learning and control is totally missing in supervised learning, okay? Um, and any other, any other points? Yeah? Supervised learning, you're saying nice in the communication world. Oh yeah, so that long-term thing is not at all a problem in supervised learning. So, so here, like you have this delayed reward issue and the cumulative reward thing, and you don't have it uh, here. Um, okay. Uh, by control, well, we are going to see that in detail, like in the course. Like, but by control, I just mean that you are also performing actions like so like I control this environment by taking this and so on. Uh, okay, so I think there is another uh, major difference which is basically reinforcement learning is trial and error process. Okay, however, supervised learning, you don't need to do trial and error. Like, so in, in supervised learning, the labels are given. For example, like if I have to do supervised learning for a robot, then I will tell exactly what action to take, like at what speed it should move, like how, do, how should it move their hands and so on, okay? So, so that's the major difference. Now, what are the differences between supervised, like reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning? Anyone? Yeah. Again, on supervised learning, we have data, but we don't have labels, so we want to find a pattern between the data. Yeah. But RL is about uh, interacting and experience. Yes. So I'll repeat the answer. So unsupervised learning, you don't have the labels at all. Like so it's just the data. And what is RL? Finding the pattern. I RL is. Well, unsupervised learning is finding the pattern, right? Like so, in RL, like you're maximizing a reward. Okay. So uh, to put it in another, I think in other words, right? Like, so in supervised learning, you have very low level feedback. Like what is the right action to take? In unsupervised learning, you don't have any feedback. So reinforcement learning is kind of in between in the sense like there is some feedback, but it is not too low level. It is very high level abstract saying, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is better, and this is worse. Okay, now, um, like before I, move on like so i want to slightly go off the notes and and talk about like practical uh like importance of having a reinforcement learning system right like so now not every problem in the world can be solved with supervised learning okay so for example let's let's think about how you learn to ride a bicycle okay now was it a supervised learning or unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning any idea Reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning. So, what were your reinforcements when you are learning to ride a bike? Uh, actually, it's based on tracking because you don't have any data. You're just learning from experience. You're falling, so you're punished, or you're 
writing to other rewards. Okay, so you are learning from experience. So like when you fall, you get punished. When you're writing well, like probably your dad or mom, like or your friends, like would just cheer up when you are three or four years old, and like you're happy that they're cheering up, right? Like so. So in some sense, it is very difficult to teach a human like learning like like to ride a bike in a supervised way okay because if i have to teach you in a supervised learning way then i should tell you the like you have to like be 90 degrees or like whenever you balance out like you have to go this many degrees like and this is the speed with which you have to like put your pedals and so on right like so it's too complicated if you if you teach someone like if you teach a kid how to lie, 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 ride a bike that way so that kid is going to hate you right like so now it's 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 sometimes it is not possible to get these labels okay and sometimes you have to learn by trial and error like sometimes you have to learn by interaction okay now these are the situations where supervised learning is out of scope so the only option that you have is reinforcement learning okay so now there are a lot of practical Mm, applications like so for example well i wish i had some slides for practical applications like so for example uh, people are using reinforcement learning uh, like when i say control like there's a there are a lot of control applications where you can use reinforcement learning like so uh, deepmind used uh, reinforcement learning to control the power usage in data centers and they were able to reduce like 30 to 40 percentage of electricity bill by just using reinforcement learning okay and and like if you were in the machine learning class like you would have uh, seen me showing videos of uh, automatic drones like uh, like from stanford like which can learn to ride like uh, like agents that can learn to ride drones without any supervision and there are a lot of other examples like so some of the recent success includes uh, i'm not sure how many of you have seen alpha go playing against lisa dong uh like in the game of go like i'm like so this agent which was trained using reinforcement learning was able to come up with really complex strategies for playing the game of go and win the human champion okay so so there are like a lot of game applications probably there are more game applications than realistic applications uh, but the number of realistic applications is growing every day like self driving cars like automated drone deliveries like so these are like really perfect examples uh, where reinforcement learning has a huge scope not immediately but in the future Okay, so now I think I have motivated enough. Uh, so we are going to uh, talk about some of the challenges in designing these reinforcement learning systems, okay? The very central challenge, well, there's credit assignment problem, but there is another central challenge in designing reinforcement learning system, which is the problem of exploration versus exploitation dilemma. Okay. Now, what is this? I told you that reinforcement learning is all about trial and error, right? So like you try an action, see how good or bad it is, you try the next action and so on, right? Now, which means you have to explore a lot. Like you have to try new actions a lot so that you know which is the best action. However, this is contradicting with our goal, which is to maximize the reward, right? Like so not just the reward, the cumulative reward, right? I want to get as good reward as possible in every time step, which means exploring would have a cost, right? Like, so if I explore and take an action which is wrong, it is going to affect my reward. Imagine a robot exploring the space and it falls from the first floor or the second floor, okay? It breaks into pieces. Now, this exploration cost the life of the robot, right? Like, so now there is no more rewards uh, because it's like it's it's broken right like so so even for us like so when we want to explore things like adventurous people like um you always have the risk of losing your life right like so like you are very careful about exploring right like so um so, so exploration is risky first of all uh, and it is also contradicting with the objective which is to maximize everyone which means you should also exploit as much as possible right so now as a reinforcement learning agent the system has to sometimes exploit. By exploit, I mean take the best action that you know is the best action. Okay, so because that is going to give you good reward. You know that it is going to give you good reward. Okay. However, if you are just exploiting, then you maybe you will miss out another action which is going to give you even better rewards in the future. Okay. So you also have to explore. Okay. So you have to exploit what 
it has already experienced in order to obtain reward okay however you also have to explore in order to make better action selection in the future okay now it is not sufficient to just explore or just exploit so if you are always exploring then you are clearly not getting the maximum cumulative reward right if you are always exploiting again you are not getting the maximum possible reward right like some possible cumulative reward okay um so but well, next week we are going to define cumulative reward as return okay so until then like i have to keep repeating this double word which is cumulative reward um yeah so either of the extremes is not a good option like so you cannot just exploit you cannot just explore uh, you have to have a trade off or a balance between exploration and exploitation now how to balance exploration and exploitation is one of the hardest problems in reinforcement learning okay and it's also a unique problem in reinforcement learning in the sense you don't have this exploration exploitation dilemma in any other learning paradigms okay so for today and probably the next week we are just going to focus on this problem of exploration versus exploitation but before we start doing that i would like to summarize like what we have seen so far okay so a summary of things i will just list the key aspects uh, that uh, we will see throughout this course okay so the first key aspect which i'm not sure if you have already noticed is the agent view of ai okay in other learning paradigms like supervised learning or unsupervised learning you don't talk much about the overall agent or the system okay so you talk about this one specific component which is interested in doing a particular prediction however reinforcement learning is more close to ai in the sense it talks about the agent and the environment and the the, the closed loop interaction between both okay now also reinforcement learning is a sequential process right like it's a sequential decision making process okay and in reinforcement learning we have delayed rewards and hence the problem of credit assignment okay and finally we also have the exploration exploitation dilemma okay now any questions so far yes uh, in reinforcement learning uh, before you uh, you can apply the agent to do a certain task i suppose you have to train it first sorry can you please repeat okay so if you have the task that you want to do, the agent to do i suppose you will see uh, you will let the agent learn how to do it before you apply it in the real world okay that is a good question so the question is like do we let the agent learn to do a task before putting it out in the real world okay the actual paradigm is like everything starts in real world right so you are learning through interaction so like for example like if you have a robot which learns to pick up trash you it starts training from scratch from like by interacting with the environment okay but in reality it's very costly right like in a lot of situations imagine amazon has self like self drive self driven automated drones to deliver packages now you cannot learn to deliver packages in the wild right like you don't want to lose a lot of packages you won't don't want to lose like you don't want to damage these drones so some learning has to be happening offline like so that it's safe right like so we are going to talk about all these things towards the end of the course like so how to do safe reinforcement learning or or how to do some offline learning before we start interacting with the world and like often people start with simulators of the world so that it's safe to explore and once you put the agent in the real world you cannot explore that much like so like you don't want 
a costly drone to take an exploratory action, which could lose you millions of dollars, right? Like, so these are complex uh, topics to discuss about, like we will discuss them uh, hopefully in the second part of the course. Yep. It's a continuation oh. of the same question. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, so in supervised learning, we have like validation. So at what point we will say the system is good to go? Okay. So yeah, I agree. It's a continuation. So the question is, uh, in supervised learning, we have validation that the system is good to go. When would we know that our reinforcement learning agent is good to go? Right. So. Again, just by construction of the framework, uh, like by the environment, like by the construction of the paradigm, like so you are already, there is no separate training stage after that you get validated and then you start interacting. Okay, so you are learning by interaction, but the same answer, like so, even though the paradigm is like that, like we're going to talk about how to do some simulated learning or like offline learning. Um, so that we know that we already have a decent system before we start. Um, yeah. How, uh, how does the size of the data set uh, vary? So let's say you're training a reinforcement late, uh, learning agent to press a booking button on a website. Because you're just looking for a button and it's just trying a bunch of different tasks, does that mean you need a smaller data set or you're okay with a smaller data set because it's just but there is no okay so the question is like about the size of the data set needed to train an oral agent but there is no data set here per se right like so we are learning through interaction like so we are not learning through data like we are not learning from past experience so like in your example like of clicking a button in the website you'll put the agent to try things in the website <coughs> and it is going to figure out like what is the right thing to do by itself so would that work only on that website then? So let's say I give it a new web, would I need to train it on 10 websites, 20, 100? That's the question of generalization. Uh, let's leave it for later. So of course the goal is to have a versatile system which can work with any website, right? Like So we're not going to worry about that at least for the first half of the course, but they are very good questions, deep questions, like uh, we will answer them in the second half of the course. <coughs> Any other questions? Yep. Can we say that the training assignment is directly related to the reward assignment? To what? Can we say that the training assignment is directly related to the reward assignment? Yes. Uh, just give me one second. <coughs> Assignment is related. My question was about is the training assignment directly related to the reward assignment? Right? My question is the function, the two functions are the same or they are related or they are different? But they are the same, right? Like it's just that you are doing credit assignments for the rewards. So they are just two different views. Like so delayed rewards is from the forward view. But the credit assignment is from the backward view. Uh, there was a, maybe one last question. Yeah. Uh, for, for the sequence of uh, between uh, the agent and the environment, the actions and reviews, can we do it? Uh, can we do the process in a parallel way? In a parallel way. Uh, what do you mean by parallel way? We get uh, many uh, observations in, in the same part. To get better. Yes, of course you can. Yeah. So the question is, can we do these interactions in parallel? Yes, you can do it. Like, in fact, if you deploy these systems, probably they are going to like uh, answer queries for multiple users at the same time. Okay, so we will stop here because we need to take a break and uh, we will start with exploration exploitation uh, at 1130.